Well, welcome all. My name is Seth Green, and on an afternoon like this one, where we're talking to a great scholar, I'm especially grateful to say that I'm the dean here at the Graham School at the University of Chicago. And we are thrilled to be featuring a preview of an upcoming course at the Graham School that will be this spring on the invention of the scientist. It is being taught by instructor Anastasia Klimchinskaya, who is someone who knows this university well as a former postdoctoral fellow at the Institute on the Formation of Knowledge. Uh, she came to us after receiving her PhD at the University of Pennsylvania, and she has previously taught at the Graham School a number of courses that have been beloved, including Man and the Machine. Uh, I am grateful today to be talking with her about what happened in the 19th century as we saw the advent of the idea of a scientist as both a word and as a concept. There was the natural philosopher whose purview had for centuries been a theoretical understanding of the world, but it was replaced with the word scientist, a word coined in 1834. Uh, and that led to a very new way of looking at science that persists to this day. And so Anastasia, it's wonderful to welcome you. It feels very timely to be looking at the invention of this field because this is certainly something that has taken off since in our both vocabulary and in our worldview. And before we jump into the course, I wanna lay the table with a bit of background on who you are and how you came to this course. As I mentioned, you received your PhD in comparative literature at Penn. You were focusing on the way science fiction emerged as a literary form in the 19th century to express a new social and techno-scientific paradigm. Can you talk a little bit about your academic background and what interested you at this intersection of literature, science, and technology? Yeah, well, I can also pre preface that by saying, uh, even before that, I was actually an undergraduate at the University of Chicago, so I'm also an alum. So um, oh, I have many, many connections to the University of Chicago, which is very dear to my heart. Um, but in terms of uh, my work, uh, so I've, you know, I, I am a literary scholar who has always been drawn to literature, to narrative, and to the ways that literature and stories really shape how we see the world. They're the lenses through which we look at reality and uh, form our assumptions and our preconceptions. Uh, but science as well is a way of looking at the world, at attempting to understand it better, to understand how things work. Um, and this idea that, you know, science and art and science and literature are kind of polar opposites, separate, different, kind of things is a relatively new and modern one. So I've actually always been interested in uh, what we would call the history of ideas, which is to say, you know, um, how do scientific ideas develop and permeate into uh, popular consciousness? And then how does fiction, how does literature, how do our stories and our art uh, reflect these ideas? So uh, I'm just, uh, very interested in looking at literary texts as almost kind of um, these um, seismographs to borrow a word from a wonderful colleague named John Trash or sort of litmus tests of how people were thinking about the world around them and the scientific discoveries around them. Um, that's also why I really love teaching at Graham because that lets me um, teach all of these interdisciplinary courses where I get to uh, teach literary texts alongside scientific and philosophical texts and uh, art, visual texts, cinema, because all of these are sort of records of how people used to think and how ideas developed and, and permeated our consciousness. Um, and it can be very interesting to to trace those lineages across decades and across centuries. Well, I want to jump in to the particular way that you're looking at this intersection in this upcoming course, which is to look at how the idea and the actual word of scientist comes into our world in 19th century literature. And so mm -hmm. I want you to kind of give us a overview 
uh, when you say the invention of the scientist, the name of the course, what does that mean? And how is the scientist being invented in the 19th century? Yeah. Um, and so for that, I have to back up just a little bit um, yeah. and talk just a little bit about, you know, the development of science. We've always had something that we would today call science, you know, uh, people trying to understand what the world around them um, is like, uh, how how things work. Uh, you know, that's that's been around since antiquity. Um but the ways in which we do that has been different. So uh, for so much of, for example, the Middle Ages, the Renaissance, uh, this is a very kind of abstract approach. Uh, this idea that you learn about the world by observing and then thinking and then using logic to draw conclusions. Um, there wasn't this idea of experimentation of physically interacting with the world of you know just kind of going to poke with it with a stick um that's an idea that comes around in kind of during the scientific revolution in the 17th century you start to get the idea of experimentation and the idea that you know science is a hands-on thing where you don't just observe the natural world but you do something to it you try to bend it to your will um you interact with it and that gives you results and that gives you um ways in which you can use those discoveries and apply them um you know to to human needs um and so then if we fast forward to the 19th century or the late 18th early 19th century this is the period when we're getting um, industrialization. And, you know, I'm sure all of you have studied the Industrial Revolution in school at some moment in time. Um, so I'm not going to kind of beat a dead horse here, but what I will kind of emphasize is the way that this took science from sort of the enclosed laboratories of gentlemen scientists and the kind of aristocratic salons where it tended to exist and it um, made it affect normal people on a widespread scale from hmm. you know, communication technologies, the railroad to indoor lighting, the phonograph, all of these things that were entering homes that were just really reshaping and all of these new technologies and discoveries are really reshaping how people lived on a, on a daily basis how they existed in their day-to-day -day life. Um, and so once you have this major reconfiguration of how people exist, um, what I argue is that, you know, if the scientist is a scientific expert, is an expert in these discoveries, these innovations, then if you have science and technology entering human life in an unprecedented way, this raises the question of, well, what is the role, but also what is the responsibility of the scientist in this new and reconfigured world? Um, not only what does the scientist kind of do, well, the scientist does science, but also what role do they play within the society they exist in and what responsibility do they have to the society around them that is being being now majorly affected by their many discoveries. Well, so you've laid out a very compelling context, which is that there is this set of questions that society is asking about who is the scientist in this changing world? What do they do? And then what are their responsibilities ethically back to society? And your course is actually going to examine this kind of conversation that underpins all of those questions through literature. And I know mm -hmm. on your reading list, you're going to have Frankenstein, you'll have From the Earth to the Moon, and Jurassic Park. So you'll really take us through the 19th century, but then obviously Jurassic Park takes us, you know, even closer to today. Yeah, uh, well, and, and those, are, oh, yeah. those are just three of, um, we'll, we'll read more than those three texts, but those are um, kind of three of the key texts. Um, and yes, they all have um, some very interesting connections between them, yeah. Well, so what I thought we do in this kind of teaser version of your class is just dive in to those three 
and look at how the scientist is understood, how the scientist is being invented in these three examples. And so uh, Frankenstein is maybe the, you know, iconic example. <laughs> of, the the uh, urtext uh, of science right. fiction, perhaps. So, so yeah, let's dive in. I mean, and just in case anyone is not familiar, maybe you can just give us like the 30 second, you know, high level plot, but then, then we can dive into kind of how it is asking and in some ways answering some of these questions about the scientist. Yeah, um, so Frankenstein, for those of you who may not be sure, Frankenstein is the scientist, not the monster. Um, he in fact creates what we think of as the monster. Um, he collects body parts and animates them with electricity and essentially creates a being. But then I don't think this is a major spoiler. Um, really abdicates his responsibility towards this being that he has created. Um, and so that text is very interesting. It was written in 1818, uh, or excuse me, published in 1818. It was written around um, 1816, 1817. Uh, so this is a moment when we don't even have the word scientist. That would be uh, coined in 1834. So, uh, in the text, Frankenstein is referred to as a natural philosopher, which of course is an older term, um, often used in the 18th century, and you know, <laughs> obviously a term that suggests a kind of um, more abstract, more philosophical approach to you know understanding the greater laws of of how the world works. It's a it's a word that doesn't evoke uh, uh, any thoughts of you know hands-on scientific work. Um, but Frankenstein is a quite literally a very hands-on scientist in ways that would have been like, very disturbing to contemporaries for multiple reasons, because he's going through graveyards and charnel houses, and he's digging up dead bodies um, to learn about anatomy and to, you know, stitch together this body and, and figure out the principle of life. Um, and I mean, on the one hand, that's disturbing because he's disturbing graves of, of people who have been laid to rest, whose last rites have been performed. This is on consecrated ground. Um, you know, you're, you're not supposed to dig those up. This, this is blasphemous. This is absolutely inappropriate. And this was actually a big problem around the time Frankenstein was writing in that uh, medical education was really developing, but the supply of bodies, so to speak, was um, limited. So there's many problems with the grave robbing. So on the one hand, he's doing this very disturbing thing of digging up these bodies, uh, which is something contemporaries would have been very familiar with. Um, but on the other hand, he is, he is hands-on and he is hands-on in kind of the most gruesome way in that he's working with these corpses he's he's dissecting them he's he's pulling them apart um so if you read the third chapter of frankenstein which is where he discusses it or where he describes all of this um it's you know it, it's one of those chapters that really make it a horror novel as, as well as a science fiction novel and so then he creates this being and I I think, you know, I'm on the one hand, I'm wary of giving spoilers. And on the other hand, this is this is a 200 year old novel. Uh, so he creates this being and he absolutely abdicates his responsibility towards this being. He abandons it. And as a result, this being uh, hurts people and, and kills people and and just um becomes a, a plague and a blight onto Frankenstein's family. So it's a it's an interesting commentary in many ways. It drew from Mary Shelley's personal life about, you know, an absent father who, who um, abdicates responsibility to their offspring, but it also arguably is making an argument about the scientist who abdicates responsibility towards what he has created and as a result that creation ravages his family and his friends and the world around him um 
and it just leaves a trail of blood and and we might find you know uh many parallels to to the modern day or to real world scientists and to you know uh inventions they may have made or, or creations um that they put into the world but whose consequences they did not think about well, so I want to jump ahead in your reading list and go to From the Earth to the Moon. And mm -hmm. maybe not only can you describe this and then how they look at the scientists, but also maybe, you know, compare a little bit to how this differs than the Frankenstein vision of the scientist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I also do want to say that sort of, again, uh, the scientist here, it's a very new word. Um, you know, it's not like everybody collectively got together and said, well, we have this new thing called the scientist. Let's 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 figure right. out what the responsibility is. But again, going back to looking at literary texts as kind of historical evidence, if you have many texts in a period of time writing about similar concerns, you can sort of say, well, this is something this was in the air. This was something that people were concerned about and trying to work through in various literary texts. Um, so in Frankenstein, you have somebody who is um, a natural philosopher. He is studying chemistry and science at a university and using those studies. Uh, once we get to uh, From the Earth to the Moon, which is about 40 years later, it was written in um, 1865. Uh, we have, um, as so often happens with Verne, we kind of have these more amateur scientists. We often have these kind of societies of expert amateurs or amateur experts. Um, in this particular case, it's actually um, the Baltimore Gun Club. And what they're experts in is artillery, really, guns and artillery and cannons and, and these sorts of things. Um, but they decide to undertake this scientific project and, and technological project of going to the moon. And so uh, it's a very interesting uh, reading. Uh, it's a very interesting tale of how Vern at this moment in time imagines this project um, as not just a technological problem, but also a social problem. So how do experts from various fields come together? You have this gun club who is prepared to shoot a cannon up at the moon, but they don't know anything about orbital mechanics. So they write to an observatory in Cambridge and say, you know, um, how, when is the best time to launch? So, you know, when are the, when is the moon and the earth aligned in such a way that it's the best time to launch? Where is the best place on the planet to launch from? Um, they bring in all sorts of experts. They fundraise money uh, from people around the world. So they make it a sort of, in a way, a citizen science project, but at the same time, not. Um, it's kind of extractive um, in the way that citizen science, unfortunately, can often be where uh, people around the world produce, you know, um, volunteer labor and volunteer money. But in the end of the day, three people get to go up in that moon capsule and, and go to the moon. Um, and, you know, definitely three sort of um, upper class gentlemen or, or middle class bourgeois men get to go up in that tiny little capsule and see the moon. Uh, so it's this interesting exploration of, um, what, how that project, how how a moonshot project really exists on a broad social scale. And we might think about the Apollo program and how excited, you know, the public got about that and how journalism um, added excitement to this project and how this was kind of a project of national fervor. But at the same time, you know, only three people go up in that little capsule and go to see the moon. Um, so that that contradiction between who gets to contribute, but then who gets the laurels, who gets the, you know, the praise and the um, 
Uh, yeah, the the praise of, of having done this brave thing, I think, in the same way that, you know, we praise and we celebrate the astronauts who have done this uh, wonderful and dangerous thing. But sometimes we forget to praise the, you know, the people who, who have written a mountain and, and it liter literally is a mountain of code, you know, going up to here to to set to launch um to launch that project all towards the moon or to launch that rocket towards the moon. Well so I have one more question and then we're going to turn over to the many questions that are populating the chat. Um, I want to bring us all the way toward the end of the syllabus and Jurassic Park, uh, a movie mm -hmm. many of us are familiar with and a book obviously before the movie. Uh, talk about the role of the scientists here and how it is now playing with another notion of the scientists and the ethical frontiers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, so I love Jurassic Park, um, the book, for many reasons. Uh, for those of you who got excited that we might be watching the movie, we're, we're reading the book, uh, but you can see the movie afterwards. Um, and I thought it was a, it, it, um, actually a wonderful sort of continuation of many of these ideas and texts we're seeing in the 19th century. We'll be reading the doctor, uh, the island of Dr. Moreau, where um, there's a scientist named Dr. Moreau who's doing these experiments on a secluded island, just like in Jurassic Park, you have these experiments on a secluded island. Um, and so on. Uh, but I think the interesting question with Jurassic Park is, you know, if you want to look at it through some kind of lens of scientific ethics and, and right and wrong, is the issue that they created dinosaurs in the first place? Or is the issue that they did it without oversight on this secluded island and, and told nobody? Um, and so the film version uh, has this wonderful line uh, said by Jeff Goldblum, where he's sort of leaning back in his chair and he's sort of, uh, your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could, that they never stopped to think about whether they should. And it's, it's this wonderful, but it's, it's this very simple line uh, 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 about, you know, maybe the scientist shouldn't do X, maybe maybe the scientist shouldn't invent this thing, maybe we should, you know, put put the genie back in the bottle. Um, but I think the novel is so much more complex uh, where it's an exploration of, okay, well, if in theory you wanted to bring dinosaurs back and we're seeing similar things happening right now with um, scientists, bringing back extinct, um, usually extinct, like uh, flowers using seeds they have discovered somewhere, frozen somewhere and extracting the DNA. So that's something that, that we're definitely seeing um, being done. Um, and the question is, I think more, is there a way to do it ethically? Um, you know, was there a way to do something like Jurassic Park ethically? Um, and what are the sort of modes of failure that that prevented that from happening in that specific context and of course there's a lot of commentary there on um sort of the way that there's no legal oversight because they're on this kind of island off of costa rica and it international scientific ethics and in, in like international scientific ethical guidelines and laws are very complicated uh, because different countries um, have different you know beliefs about what is and isn't okay in terms of say experimenting on animals or what it is ethical to do so um, they specifically chose this kind of nebulous area it's literally called Isla Nublar um, they did it in complete secrecy because they're a private corporation. So they had the opportunity to to do it in complete secrecy without um, seeking any kind of oversight from any um, review boards or or scientific journals or any of that those frameworks that generally exist to make sure scientists follow ethical guidelines. Um, and so 
I, I think it's an interesting exploration of sort of, to put it simply, maybe what what did they do wrong? What what are what are the ways in which they escaped the various forms of oversight that would have allowed um, those scientists to maybe approach this in a more ethical way? Well, this is going to be a fascinating course. Uh, the way that you've Thank described you. the books and the way that they investigate this topic is really compelling and. You know, you see echoes of these issues just in constant everyday life today as we look at how do you think about the possibilities of AI and the challenges that may present to, you know, our understanding of what's human and what's not and how we navigate all of these. And so it's really interesting to think about how past people through literature navigated some of these questions as we confront them. Um, I want to come to the chat because there are many questions. I'm going to start with one from Teresa Hahn. Um, and she mentions that the gender neutral term scientist, as opposed to natural philosopher or man of science, was coined specifically to describe Mary Somerville by the philosopher William Wewell in 1834. Um, that strikes me as quite significant that this would have started with the description of a woman in a time when you know there was less recognition of women's leadership and a num in any domain. Um, and I'm curious, uh, and, and uh, Teresa as well, if you could comment on that meaning and origin. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it, that's true. Um, it was coined by William Weevil, who was a, um, a scientist and science popularizer himself. And he was actually um, reviewing a, a text um, that, that, that Mary Somerville wrote. Um, she was a science popularizer as well. Uh, and I do have to mention that, um, unfortunately, all of the scientists in the text we'll be reading are male, because unfortunately, in the 19th century, that's how it went. Um, there were female scientists and women making, uh, you know, brilliant discoveries and, and innovations. Uh, but then if we look back at these literary texts, um, and as they're trying to grapple with the idea of the scientist, uh, they're mostly portraying male scientists. And on the one hand, this this is maybe sort of uh, a blind spot. But uh, on the other hand, in cases like Frankenstein, uh, gender is sort of a, a big through line of the novel in, in the sense that um, not only Frank is Frankenstein a scientist, he is a male scientist. And there is this um, very gendered thing going on there that a wonderful scholar named Anne Mellor has written about, whom we'll read, um, where Frankenstein uh, approaches science, uh, nature in a very feminine um, feminine way. You know, nature is female. Nature must be penetrated. Nature must be controlled. Uh, nature must be, you know, put to his use. Uh, uses as, as a as a masculine scientist who desires to have this creative power, this godlike power. So there she's critiquing the kind of um that gendered approach to the scientist as male and and nature as female. But then unfortunately in texts like Jules Verne, who is a favorite author of mine and a wonderful, wonderful contributor to the field of science fiction, but who unfortunately just has no female characters in his novels anywhere, let alone um, scientist, and who is thinking about this um, kind of new figure of, of the expert or the at least very informed amateur or the scientist, but uh, can't seem to imagine um, that figure taking on any form other than the male. Um, and I think maybe in some ways this is a limitation of, of using just literary text as your cultural evidence. And that's why it's so important to read literary text alongside all sorts of other primary sources to get a broader sense of what was going on while at the same time understanding that you know, these major literary texts, these are representations of uh, what people were talking about, what, what people were concerned with in, in like on the broadest scale. 
Michael Praise asks, will you touch on the role of the scientists in the day the Earth stood still? Uh, so unfortunately, that is not one of the texts on the syllabus. Um, since we have only eight weeks, uh, I had to really uh, kind of be selective about which text we did read. So um, I think we touched on about three or four, which leaves like four other weeks. Uh, but I'm I'm more than happy to you know, provide a reading list at the end uh, at the end of the course. And there's there's many other texts to explore. Um, Richard Kamer mentions that he recently read Nathaniel Hawthorne's The Birthmark and is curious if this is one of the earliest mentions of a scientist in literature. I think we know from your earlier comments in the chat that the we well is, seems to be the invention of this term referring to Mary Somerville, but where does Nathaniel Hawthorne's The Birthmark fit in to that timeline? So to my recollection, the, the birthmark um, is actually not about the scientist. Um, it's uh, a, a, a rather different text, but um, Nathaniel Hawthorne has written um, what we would call early science fiction. He he has written a text called Rappuccini's Daughter. Uh, so he definitely has a scientist figure um, and we'll, we'll be reading that um, short story, Rappuccini's Daughter alongside some Edgar Allan Poe. Um, because you have some interesting things going on there where um, it's a sort of, uh, um, excuse me, uh, fairy tale-esque um, kind of story, but with definitely a, a scientist figure there. So there's a series of comments here and then a question from Jerry Ree, basically asking whether, you know, you feel, and I don't know if you uh, feel qualified to comment on this, whether modern scientists lack a clear conception of the science of morals as understood in the history of ideas. So put another way- I, I'm sorry, could you could you repeat that? I didn't quite ca catch the entire- yeah. I mean, I read the question as um, whether you feel that scientists today, um, you know, are really looking at this history and reflecting on the history of ideas as they think about the morals of science? Like, do you, do you feel that there is um, connection between the work that you're doing and looking at the invention of the scientists and how we kind of came over time to moralize this role and think about those norms and the practice of science today? If, you know, how connected are those two endeavors? Uh, I mean, I'm sure many scientists have read, say, you know, Frankenstein or Jules Verne. Uh, very often there is some book that got a scientist or an engineer interested in what they're doing. And, and often it's, you know, a book like Jules Verne. Um, I, I don't know if they are or that they are, but we also have to understand that, um, you know, in our modern day and age, uh, we we live in a very different world where we have a very um, kind of, I don't want to say clear set of guidelines, but we certainly have very strict ethical guidelines for if you want to do an experiment and you, you want to get funding, you have to explain what you're going to do if you're going to have human subjects or if you're going to have animal test subjects, um, how you're going to approach that. Um, you have to apply for approval from various boards um, and only if you followed all of these guidelines will the major journals publish you. So journals like, for example, Nature, they will not publish your scientific findings unless, you know, you can show that you followed all the proper guidelines. Um, there are some international guidelines, though, again, that's that's difficult because, you know, that means that diff different countries have to agree on what is ethical and different cultures sort of have different approaches to say, you know, animal testing. Um, so I think that since we're uh, kind of living in a world where we have all of these um, legal and ethical frameworks and guidelines, there there isn't, you know, maybe quite as much of a desire to, um, for, for the scientists, for, for today's scientists to, to go read this or or maybe for 
um, fiction today to to explore this in the same way. I think what makes the 19th century so exciting is, you know, it, it really was a kind of reconfigured world order. Um, and once when when sweeping changes happen that really reconfigure how you exist on it on a daily basis there is this desire to figure out how do we live in this new world and what these stories testify to is um trying to figure out how how to live in this new world and and who to listen to as an expert we have a question about the other books that you'll read over the course, and I actually will put the syllabus directly into the chat, but uh, curious if you wanted to comment on any of the other books in particular. Yeah, um, so in a, yeah, um, I mentioned that we'll be reading uh, The Island of Dr. Moreau by H.G. Wells, which is a fascinating novel, but uh, I think would take too long to get into it uh, at the moment. Uh, but I can say that it is a novel that scandalized everybody when it was published. It was called, you know, <laughs> blasphemous and unethical in, in many ways. So he he really scandalized everyone there. Uh, and I did also want to add that we'll be reading uh, Sherlock Holmes, which uh, I think maybe isn't quite as intuitive uh, for something on the syllabus. But uh Sherlock Holmes is, in a way, a scientist. You know, he refers to his practice as the science of deduction, and and he refers to it as this uh, very methodical thing of observation and logic, and not making hypotheses or or not drawing conclusions unless he has the data to go on, um, and who is often described as a thinking and reasoning machine. And this idea of me mechanization as a form of objectivity um, was this new 19th century idea um, that Peter Daston and, and Lorraine, Ga or uh, Lorraine Daston and Peter Gallison um, have written about the way that objectivity is this new 19th century idea that comes about with all of these new technologies, machines that can supposedly sort of uh, mitigate human error. And, and so Sherlock Holmes, when he's described as an observing and reasoning machine, he is kind of symbolic of that scientific ideal of objectivity, of, of getting rid of human biases through kind of mechanistic observation of the world. So, uh, We'll be reading essentially the detective story and and considering the detective as a scientist, which uh, is an approach that I'm really excited to introduce the students to. Well, um, we are coming up to time, uh, Anastasia. I'll answer one question in the chat here from Kai. The course is virtual in nature, um, so it will be online. So you can be anywhere and be a part of it. Um, any closing comments on you know, your experience, I know you mentioned this at the opening, but as a instructor in the Graham School, what you love about the classroom and how you approach a really interactive experience for your students. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I was just reading uh, all the wonderful comments in the chat and so many people are uh, posting wonderful links to various books and, and op-eds. Um, so uh, thank you everyone for being so active in the chat. Um, you asked about some act uh, some last words about um, I think you asked about making the class interactive. Yeah, just last words about I know you love teaching at Graham. I know you love the kind of type of learner that comes to us. And so uh, maybe it's my bias as uh, Dean of Graham, but I thought it'd be a perfect ending here to just have you share some of those thoughts about what makes the classroom so special at Graham when you teach it and you know how you approach. And I know you use Socratic dialogue and discussion as a core element of your approach. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I have so many uh, students coming in who are so enthusiastic about the course and who bring in different backgrounds. When I taught Man is Machine, I had uh, you know, people with a background in engineering uh, or, or computer science who had been doing it for decades. And I also had, you know, 
people from the humanities. So first of all, it's really great to get people from those different fields talking to each other when we're discussing something like science fiction or the history of science and really combining the humanities um, and, and the scientists and, and the sciences. Um, but that also means that we're getting uh, people who are so interested and so invested in and just uh, bringing so much knowledge to the course already. Um, yeah. So one of the things I've always done in my courses uh, is uh, so there is, of course, a, a lecture component where, um, you know, I kind of I present background, I present context. And there's also a discussion component where we we all talk about it and discuss. Um, and one of the things I really love to do and which I think is so great to do with Graham precisely because you have all of these very enthusiastic students from these different backgrounds is every day. Um, or every week when I walk into course and into the class, I say, you know, what would you like to discuss today? Were there any aspects of the reading that particularly struck you and you wanted to make sure you discuss, we discuss, or any questions uh, that you especially had, um, anything you encountered in the reading that you think we absolutely must address? And so, um, going on from that uh as as that session goes on i you know, adapt both the lecture and the discussion towards those student-led questions um so that uh it's not just me talking at the class for two and a half hours because you know who wants that um but it's really a discussion where all of these very smart people from different backgrounds can bring in their insights um, and, and sometimes point out things in the text that I haven't always noticed because nobody can notice everything. And it becomes this really rich, really inter interdisciplinary discussion, which is uh, what I really love. Well, I'll just echo that your students love it as well. Uh, I see throughout the chat people commenting on past courses they've taken and their excitement for this opportunity with you. Thank you for teaching at the Graham School, and thank you all for joining us today. One of the things that's so exciting about our school is that we have people like Anna who are bringing all of these different disciplines together, and we have learners who are coming from so many different lived experiences that you can really be in a classroom setting where you're both thinking in a multidisciplinary fashion, and there are people that actually have lived experience across disciplines there to think with you. Uh, we look forward to many of you joining us this spring for this course, and uh, I know there are many familiar faces here, so I look forward to seeing you at another conversation, Nick Ram, again soon. Have great afternoons, everyone, and Anastasia, thank you again for your time and your insights. Absolutely. Thank you so much, and I look forward to seeing you in the class.